Welcome to Capital Link's company presentation series. I am Nicholas Bornodis, President of Capital Inc., and I would like to welcome you to the 2024 Capital Inc. Corporate Presentation Series. In this series, company management highlights the company's current operations, business development, growth prospects, and sector outlook. We have today the senior management of uh, MPC containerships, represented by Mr. Moritz Perman, the chief financial officer. MPC containerships is the leading container tonnage provider focusing on small to mid-sized container ships. The company owns and operates a portfolio of container ships serving intra-regional trade lanes on fixed charters. And as of September 30, 2023, the group's fleet consisted of 65 vessels. Uh, MPC Container Ships is listed on the Onslow Stock Exchange under the symbol MPCC. Uh, in terms of logistics, uh, we begin with the company presentation followed by Q&A. So uh, please, uh, for the participants, uh, you are welcome to submit your questions anytime during this webinar. And Moritz is going to reply to them, answer to them after he finishes with the slide presentation. Uh, a reminder on the disclaimer that uh, please, uh, remind yourselves that uh, this discussion today is strictly for informational and educational purposes and should not be relied upon. The webinar does not constitute an offer to buy or sell securities or investment advice or advice of any kind, obviously, and Capital Link bears no responsibility for the content. Uh, and we have the privilege to work with uh, MPC containerships on uh, investor relations. So with this, I will turn over the floor to Moritz. Moritz, thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, Nicolas, and very happy to be here. Good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Um, before jumping into the presentation, also a remark from our side that the presentation contains uh, certain forward-looking statements as well as estimates, uh, which might differ uh, substantially from, from actual numbers. Uh, looking at the setup of the presentation today, we have three pillars, uh, starting with uh, a bit of a general information on our company, a market update, and some, some outlooking slides uh, on MPCC going forward. Uh, who are we? MPCC is the leading intra-regional tonnage provider uh, with the 56 vessels currently uh, in the water and four new buildings uh, to be delivered in uh, 2024 um, with a total capacity of uh, close to 135,000 uh, TU. From a balance sheet perspective, and that also goes hand in hand with the, our capital allocation policy and our principles. Uh, as of Q3 23, we had an industry low uh, leverage of 70%, uh, while at the same time having 22 vessels unencumbered. And looking at the earnings backlog, uh, we have a revenue backlog of, of around US dollar 1 billion. Having said capital, capital allocation policy and principles, uh, there's, there's three uh, principles when it comes to capital allocation. Uh, one is uh, obviously returning capital to shareholders. So over the last 24 months, uh, we have been uh, distributing substantial capital back to shareholders uh, in terms of dividends, talking about a number of uh, close to 730 million US dollars. Uh, at the same time, as mentioned before, we have uh, significantly reduced uh, the leverage on the balance sheet, um, and while at the same time, uh, being very selective when it comes to fleet optimization and fleet renewal. Uh, again, we have ordered four new buildings with long-term contracts in place, but also uh, last summer acquired a fleet of five modern uh, feeder vessels. From a corporate setup perspective, uh, we have a very strong long-term committed uh, anchor investor with MPC Capital and the family behind MPC Capital. Um, and we have a very proven ESG commitment. So from an ESG reporting perspective, MPCC is, uh, is top rated um, amongst uh, a Nordic stock listed uh, shipping companies. Having mentioned focus on interregional trade, so MPCC with its feeder vessels has a distinct focus on that specific uh, trade. As you can see on the left hand side, the fleet is, is evenly distributed uh, amongst uh, the main 
interregional uh, trade areas, being Americas, uh, intra Europe, but also intra Asia. Um, the overall container market, um, the, the lion's share of the fleet from a, from a number of vessels perspective is in the 1000 uh, to 5000 TU segment, which is, as you can see at the bottom right, uh, dedicated towards the, the interregional trade with the, around 55% of vessels being deployed there. Within that specific segment, MPC container ship is the largest uh, tonnage providers uh, with 60 vessels, um, clearly giving us a, a a strong advantage uh, uh, over our competitors. Looking at the capital market and the corporate profile, uh, the company is listed on the Oslo Stock Exchange. Uh, we IPO'd in, in April uh, 27. Current market cap is around 600 million US dollars um, and with a very low net debt of around 72 million US dollars. Again, emphasizing on, on, uh, on the low leverage strategy Briefly looking at the shareholder uh, constitution, again, 17% is owned by our anchor investor, the MPCC group, MPC group and, and, and the family. And the rest is, uh, is evenly distributed uh, between international investors and Norwegian investors. At the bottom, you can see the, uh, the share price development um, since embarking on the dividend journey uh, roughly two years ago. Uh, you can see that adjusted um, for the dividends paid out, the, the share price performance is actually uh, quite constant, um, especially in 23, floating around the NOC, uh, NOC 30 number, um, which shows very strong resilience if you consider the, the more recent adverse news in the market around, con uh, around the container market itself. Uh, it's actually a quite a quite strong share price performance uh, when adjusting for for the dividend that that we paid out. And just uh, having said before, the number is seven hundred and thirty million US dollars, which is, as you can see, more than the current market cap. Looking into the dividends in more detail, again, um, we started paying out dividends in late twenty one, early twenty two. As you can see. Uh, the performance has been quite stable when it comes to distributing the capital back to, to, to shareholders. Total number is 732 million US dollars. Uh, as you can see, it has historically been a mix of uh, the recurring dividend. So uh, we have committed ourselves to distributing 75% of an adjusted net profits back to shareholders. On top, we can uh, pay out between 0 and 100% uh, of event-driven uh, distributions when it comes to vessel sales, for example. So we have done in the past, um, but you can see that as of uh, Q1, Q2, 23, the focus was uh, mainly on recurring dividends. And when we have been selling vessels in that time period, the focus was more when it comes to capital allocation on repaying debt on the balance sheet. So again, it's always a fine balance for us to, to keep returning uh, capital to shareholders. And again, we will keep uh, we will be uh, committed to uh, keeping the recurring dividend, uh, but obviously there's some flexibility when it comes to the event-driven distribution. Um, uh, regardless uh, of this sort of slight shift, as you can see, uh, the dividend yield is, is incredibly strong. In 22, uh, we had a dividend yield of close to 50%, and in 23, uh, with the Q3 announced dividend that has been paid out in uh, late December 23, uh, we are around 40, 43%. Again, very strong testament to, uh, to our commitment on uh, returning uh, capital to shareholders and also a very strong testament to the strengths of the company and the earnings visibility and repaying uh, capital to shareholders. Now, looking at the market, uh, giving some, uh, some updates on, on recent development as well. From a macro perspective, um, as you can see, uh, G global GDP uh, forecast is for 23 around 2.9%, which obviously is positive. Uh, historically, that has been translating into a uh, also very positive growth uh, from a container demand perspective. Talking about uh, GDP multiplier uh, remains to be seen whether that multi the historical sort of multiplier is also uh, applicable going forward. Um, regardless, we expect positive uh, demand growth. Uh, however, I should say, uh, and we will talk about this uh, in a few moments, um, the demand growth is expected to be outpaced by supply growth given the uh, significant order book. Obviously, there is a distinction between 
um, the larger sizes and the smaller sizes being the feeder sizes uh, that that MPCC is is active in. On the right hand side, um, a little focus on our customers, the liner companies, the operators. Uh, so what has happened uh, in the last four years, uh, talking about 2019, so pre-COVID um, and uh, 23. Um, so we have here a selected basket of certain liner companies, uh, including Maersk, Hapag Lloyd, Evergreen, HMM, uh, ONE, for example. What is clearly visible that the liner companies have been using the incredibly strong period in 21 and 22 uh, to strengthen their balance sheets. Um, so as you can see, cash position has been going up significantly uh, and so has the equity position. And if you look at the net to debt, uh, net debt to equity ratio, this has been reduced by uh, roughly uh, 75%. So um, if you compare this situation uh, to the post Lehman crisis, uh, the liner companies, uh, i.e. our customers, are in a very different shape, uh, meaning in a much more positive situation, again, relative to uh, more than 10 years ago. Looking at the freight markets on the left-hand side, um, obviously quite visible that both um, freight rates but also second-hand values have been sort of falling off the cliff um, with the recent sort of development in, in the container markets with a, let's say, a subdued um, demand situation in, in, the, in the second half of 22, but also 23. Um, while, at the same, while at the same time, uh, it seems that both indices sort of have stabilized at levels uh, above uh, pre-COVID and above historical averages, which is positive. Um, at the same time, and interestingly, you can see that the new building index is, is actually going the uh, opposite direction, uh, which is mainly driven by um, the uh, field order books of, of the yards, um, talking about delivery times now uh, way into 27. And for some of the larger vessels, I think you're talking about 28 uh, delivery positions. At the same time, labor cost has gone up um, in line with inflation and so has material cost. So that's actually the explanation for uh, what we think is um, still sort of uh, historically high uh, new building prices. On the left, on the right hand side, quickly looking at the overall market, yes, there has been adverse news on the container space. Uh, liner company um, revenue and and profit numbers have uh, come down uh, drastically, I should say, uh, relative to twelve months ago. Uh, but overall. Uh, looking at the idle statistics, uh, so the most recent uh, numbers that we have from, from early Jan 24 uh, shows that there's a 121 vessels idle. That includes um, vessels out for dry docking, retrofits, so uh, talking about very little commercial idle vessels. Um, so that represents around 1% of the fleet. So you could almost argue that the fleet is, uh, is fully utilized, uh, which obviously is a, is a, is a positive sign uh, despite adverse news in the market. As mentioned before, uh, looking at the demand supply balance in the market on the left hand side, you can see the, the overall market and with the exception of 21, it's, it's quite obvious that, um, uh, that the supply growth has been outpassing demand growth, which is not a big surprise considering the order book. Um, and that will continue up until 25 when we sort of reach an equilibrium and 26 um, is expected that demand growth is again outpacing uh, the supply growth. That is the overall view. On the right hand side, um, on the on the top chart, you can see that this is the the, the demand has been split out into uh, the total market, but also a distinct um, focus on the intra regional trade. You can see that the demand growth almost goes um, hand in hand in those in those two sort of um, segments. Uh, but what is interesting to note, and now talking again about the uh, supply side of things, and I, you can see at the, at the bottom right, uh, the overall order book, uh, which is around 7.3 million TEU, the majority uh, of the order book is heavily skewed towards the larger, uh, larger sizes, with 80% being 8,000 plus TEU. Um, so what we expect going forward is a is a very... Um, different market between um, from from a demand supply uh, dynamics between the feeder segment and and the larger sizes uh, for obvious reasons. Um, so less supply growth in the feeder segments, 
um, while having sort of similar demand flows uh, relative to the to the larger sizes, which should obviously be positive uh, for MPCC as as we're operating in the in the feeder segments. Looking at the order book in more detail, uh, this is a familiar graph uh, which we tend to use in our um, uh, earnings call updates on a quarterly basis. So. On the left-hand side, you can see where the MPCC focus lies in the one to 3,000 TU segment, but also the three to 8,000 TU segment. So overall, uh, 10 to 14% uh, order book, which we believe is digestible, especially compared to the larger sizes. Um, so uh, what is obvious, the 12 to 17,000 TU uh, bracket has an order book of 55%, which is uh, clearly a, a different number. The order book obviously needs to be seen in the context of the age distribution of the uh, separate um, segments. And therefore, on, on the right hand side, which is also a very interesting statistic, where you compare the order book to fleet ratio on, on the left hand side of the graph to the sort of percentage of the fleet that is more than 20 years of age. So, again, the larger sizes, very young uh, age distribution or average age coupled with a high order book, whereas the feeder segment, relatively low order book coupled with an old fleet. So from that perspective, we feel relatively comfortable going forward that the order book um, of 10 to 14% at least in our segments will be absorbed uh, in, in the market in the foreseeable future, uh, not only by demand growth, but also by, um, by reciting activity uh, in our segments given the fleet age. Uh, and on top you have, um, regulation that is being introduced and you see some some implications already now in the, in the market when it comes to cii uh, especially on the trading uh, speed of the fleet uh, there's there's already some some implications to be seen uh, with our customers uh, slowing down uh, vessels creating uh, sort of more demand for for uh, vessels at least. one very a uh, prominent topic these days um, is the uh, current situation in the Red Sea. As you all, all know or might all be aware, um, a lot of our customers, and I'm just talking about containers, but this is equally ap uh, applicable towards uh, tankers and dry, uh, dry bulkers, uh, for example, but our customers or the majority of our customers has decided to suspend uh, traveling through the Red Sea, um, given the attacks by the Houthi rebels, um, so that obviously has a severe impact on the market. Um, instead of traveling through the uh, Suez Canal, uh, the majority of the vessel has been rerouted uh, around the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. So what does it mean um, from an operational perspective um, on certain trades between the Far East and Europe? You you're increasing the extra sailing time by 10 to 17 days, which is significant. Um, that sort of uh, translated in TU. Uh, so according to our numbers, that means between 1.5 and 1.7 million TU. Uh, so around uh, six to seven percent of global container capacity that is uh, rerouted, sort of, um, uh, or creating uh, more capacity need. So what does it mean? Obviously, there will be a shortfall of vessels uh, arriving back in, in Asia during the peak season before Chinese New Year. And, and also on the, on, the, on the equipment side of things, we expect a shortage of, of empty containers. And the, the implications are already quite visible on the box freight rate side of things. Um, so since uh, liner companies having announced uh, avoiding the Red Sea uh, uh, and Yemen area, um, the index, the NDC has gone up by around 73%. Again, that is, this is on the box freight rate side of things. Uh, on the time charter side, so um, sort of what is implicating MPCC, because we're time charting out the vessels to our customers. Um, there is right now um, certain premiums, uh, premia uh, being paid by, by charters um, if the owner allows the vessel to trade uh, through the, the Red Sea area. Um, this is not something that we will pursue, uh, but at the same time, uh, we do see and we do expect that uh, regardless of premiums being paid for, for Red Sea travels, that overall in the market, uh, we might see uh, an uptick at least in, 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 in charter rates. Obviously, 
um, it remains to be seen how sustainable uh, this situation is. Uh, we all know that uh, especially the US and the United Kingdom has deployed naval vessels uh, in that region trying to uh, sort of counterfeit um, the attacks by the by the Houthi rebels. So uh, it remains to be seen how this uh, will will evolve uh, evolve going forward. But uh, needless to say that that we will uh, closely monitor the situation and that we are in daily exchange with the, with our customers um, on on the current situation and the trading of of, of our ships. Looking ahead, uh, company outlook. Looking at some some numbers, so on the uh, left hand side, uh, you can see the uh, the revenue uh, backlog distribution uh, from twenty three to twenty six. Um, so obviously twenty three is um, is is sort of close. We haven't published the numbers yet, but you know from a coverage perspective, it's clear that uh, twenty three is now uh, hundred percent covered. But I think more interestingly, looking ahead, uh, twenty four. Again, despite and you know, regardless of the most recent Black Swan event in the Red Sea, but um, uh, despite the adverse uh, use in the container market, uh, we are in a very comfortable position with around uh, sixty-seven percent of open days uh, covered in twenty-four and twenty-five percent uh, in, in, in twenty-five already. Uh, so again, talking about the revenue backlog of US dollar one billion and the projected EBITDA backlog of point uh, seven billion. Uh, when talking about the backlog, obviously a question that we face uh, a lot of times is on the uh, resilience of the backlog and the performance of the backlog. So we, we, we always try to address that uh, with this uh, little pie chart on the right hand side. Uh, as you can clearly see, 75% uh, so of our backlog is covered by, by the top 10 liner companies and including cargo backed operators. We're talking about 85%, which is, um, which is a very comfortable number. Uh, and on top, we're talking about an average duration of our contract of 1.7 years. Again, this is all as of Q3 23. Um, so just 1.7 years, which I think is um, is also a comfortable number in terms of um, in terms of visibility into the future and in terms of visibility on our customers. Again, early on the market section, we showed uh, sort of the balance sheet performance of, of the liner companies compared uh, 2019 to 23, where you can see a uh, lot of cash cushion, high equity portions, and no low low net debt to uh, to equity. Looking at the company valuation, we uh, obviously we're facing some some headwinds there, uh, probably also due to the adverse uh, container market news. Again, we believe that there's a very interesting case to be made in, in, from from a downside uh, risk uh, protection. So if we were to look at the current enterprise value of around 685 million US dollar, this is um, completely uh, covered by the projected EBITDA or even over covered by the projected EBITDA backlog, uh, talking about an excess value, including uh, net sales proceeds um, from, from vessel sales that are already locked in uh, from an excess value of 110%. So this is, this is only a downside protection. This valuation matrix is excluding but disregarding the entire steel value of our fleet. And, and obviously we will argue that this is, a, this is a way too conservative to assume. I mean, even if we were to consume, assume the, the pure recycling value of our fleet, um, there is an, an excess value of, of more than 300 million um, on, 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 the, on the current company valuation. And again, recycling value is not the right measure to be taken with an average age of the fleet of around 16 years. Looking ahead, um, 23 and 25. Um, obviously, we have we have been uh, also running some some sensitivities on on the open days in the fleet uh, when using uh, historical um, charter rates, a ten year average, and, and for example, current rate. Uh, you can see that operating revenue, but also net profit, will come in. Uh, based on these numbers uh, on, on very healthy levels uh, and, and also very importantly, I think from an investor perspective, looking at the, uh, at the bottom chart, um, also with very, very uh, healthy dividend yields. Again, this needs to be seen, I think, uh, in the context of a, a market that, is, um, that obviously has come down significantly from, from the uh, very high levels in, in 21 and 22. Um, but I think it, it also, again, it's a testament to the company um, 
to manage uh, through at different uh, points in the cycle and, and, and being able to deliver uh, very resilient returns. Again, this is, this is, um, uh, this is based on, on an assumption on, on certain charter rates. So this is obviously not a guidance, but just to, to give an impression uh, what dividends, uh, dividend yields could look like uh, in the future if, if you take certain assumption on, on charter rates for, for open days and all paid. Having talked about uh, balance sheet uh, strengths before uh, and having emphasized on, on the very low leverage that we have. Um, so earlier this week, uh, we have announced uh, the refinancing uh, or essentially the, the repayment or the early accelerated repayment of the revolving credit facilities that we had in place with CIT and HCOP. Um, this has been uh, paid down to zero and canceled in Q4 uh, 23. Um, and at the same time, we managed to sort of refinance um, that exposure with a new RCF, releasing collateral, uh, increasing the RCF capacity uh, that remains undrawn. Um, so that is another 100 million in implied liquidity going into, uh, into 24. So from that perspective, it's not only uh, low leverage. Um, so as you can see, we, 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 we're distinguishing between the trading fleet and the new buildings uh, to come in, in 24. Uh, just looking at the trading fleet, and uh, this is pro forma expected debt outstanding end of Q3 23. Um, so just the 100 and, and around 120 million uh, secured by 18 ships, while at the same time we have 38 vessels uh, debt free. Um, but I should say that uh, the RCF, which is currently undrawn, hence debt free, is covered by 14 ships. Um, but again, uh, so. Going forward, we will continue to, to emphasize on the low leverage, but also trying to keep as much flexibility as possible from a balance sheet perspective um, with a certain amount of, of, of unencumbered vessels. So I think uh, going into 24, uh, but also 25, we are uh, incredibly well positioned uh, uh, from a very strong balance sheet perspective. Looking at the new builds, um, quite obvious, uh, slightly higher leverage. Um, which we are willing to incur because, as you can see, the construction price of our four new buildings, two in China, two in Korea, is more than covered by the projected EBITDA backlog. So all four vessels have long-term contracts in place. And, and given the cash flow and earnings visibility, obviously, uh, from a company perspective, uh, we're willing to incur a slightly higher leverage. So some... some some closing remarks, um, again, very strong financial position operationally as well, which should uh, support going forward uh, dividend distribution uh, to, to investors. Um, again, fine balance between returning capital to shareholders and maintaining a low leverage, which is something you do in a, in a, in a, in a strong uh, point in the cycle of the market. And at the same time, and we have done so executing on, on fleet optimization, uh, selling some older ships, buying some, some more modern assets and you know, uh, recycling capital into, into the long-term uh, development of the company. Um, from an outlook perspective, again, we have a very strong backlog uh, as per Q3 uh, 23 of uh, one, 1 billion US dollars from a revenue perspective, giving us a very good uh, earnings visibility despite market fluctuations. And I think, uh, the combination of earnings visibility and balance sheet strengths uh, puts us in a, in a very good position uh, to be opportunistic in the market, um, optimize the fleet, and at the same time, uh, you know, obviously continue to uh, generate attractive shareholder returns. So on that note, um, I would like to open the floor for uh, any questions that uh, people might have and uh, already Thanking everyone for for their interest and uh, attention. So I can see some questions coming in uh, on the web. Uh, can you please walk us through your capital allocation priorities going forward? Um, I try to address this uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, again, three pillars. 
Um, we will remain very committed to uh, our recurring dividends, i.e. distributing 75% of adjusted net earnings uh, to shareholders. Um, and at the same time, we will try to uh, find a balance of um, repaying debt or keeping a low leverage on the balance sheet, but also uh, renewing the fleet or investing um, selectively in, in existing assets um, in, in, in our fleet. And uh, the last comment also goes goes hand in hand with the the next question that I that is that is here. Um, how do you think about your fleet composition and strategy for the next uh, one to two years? So we have been in the second part of twenty three. We have been relatively active in in selling some vessels, uh, which uh, has has been uh, quite strategic. Um, by selling older ships in the fleet uh, with upcoming dry dockings, maybe some vessels. Uh, where we think going forward might not have the most advantageous design. Um, so there, there's um, certain rationals as to why we, we're selling those vessels. Then again, at the same time, we have been investing in, in more modern assets, not only new builds, but also uh, a small fleet of, of feeder container vessels in the summer of, of, of 23. But also, um, interestingly, next year, we are planning uh, retrofits uh, or significant re uh, retrofits on uh, around a dozen of our ship. Um, this uh, includes smaller but also larger retrofit packages uh, and uh, in, in some instances uh, will lead probably uh, to fuel savings on certain ships of between uh, 12 to 15, maybe up to 20%. Um, so again, being also committed to, to our ESG strategy of, of making our ships um, more economical, uh, economical uh, going forward. So the next question is, um, have you seen an impact on time charter rates due to the current Red Sea situation? If the situation continues, when do you expect to see time charter rates to be impacted? So I mentioned that in some instances, certain liner companies that continue to operate in the Red Sea are willing to pay hefty premiums. Um, obviously you need to convince the tonnage owners to, uh, to trade in that region. There's uh, obviously a, a risk to, to crew on boards and the assets itself. Um, what we do see right now outside of Red Sea markets from, from a time charter perspective is that um, durations on, on time charters are going slightly up uh, and maybe also a slight uptick in, in the rates itself. Again, um, it remains to be seen how sustainable uh, this situation is, uh, meaning the longer the, the situation lasts, um, the longer the situations last, obviously there will be an impact on, on freight rates. But I think right now it's it's still uh, too too early too early to to say. Um, then another question in uh, Q1 and Q2, a couple of MPCC vessels are coming off charter. Did you forward fix any of those? How are rates performing? Um, so we will be uh, uh, publishing uh, Q numbers end of end of February, and I hope that by then uh, we will uh, be in a position to report uh, something on that particular question. Um, there is currently discussions with our customers on um, on certain, let's say, uh, forward uh, fixture uh, measures. Um, so. Um, rates, rate levels that are being discussed, I would uh, define as, as uh, very interesting from, from our perspective, uh, but maybe also more interestingly, it, it, it leads also to a further, let's say, de-risking of our uh, entire 2024 20, positions and shifting some, some of those positions into 25 and maybe also 26. But again, uh, too, too early to say, but hopefully we, we are in a position uh, within the next uh, one and a half months to um, to be able to report uh, something on, uh, on this topic. Another question on the Red Sea uh, situation, which I think I just um, have addressed. So again, question demand for feeder tonnage might increase in the coming weeks for service in the Atlantic Basin as line operators will need to feed more containers to and from the Eastern Mediterranean from ships diverted around the Cape of Good Hope. <clears throat> Do you expect your company to benefit from this trend for the 33% uh, open days you have in 24? What charter rates do you see at present 
uh, for your ships. Um, yeah, obviously, um, the, the hope is there, uh, needless to say. Um, so that, that also goes a bit hand in hand with the, the, the question I just, just answered on, on some uh, forward positions that, that we are discussing with some of our customers. Um, I, I would say rate levels, um, just to, to give you an example, on, on, on current 27, 2800 TU vessels, obviously depending geographical reason, but also uh, duration of the charter is around, let's say, 12 and a half, 13, 14 thousand dollars per day, uh, maybe a tad less than 14. But again, in the historical context, this is um, this is a very um, this is a very healthy um, healthy rate level, and it remains to be seen whether this level is going up uh, given the recent uh, Black Swan event in the Red Sea. Is there any further capital profits? Uh, will you perhaps consider a share buyback rather than special capital dividend as this may mitigate tax for some shareholders? This is a recurring question that we, uh, that we see uh, uh, quite often. Um, this is something that, that is uh, obviously uh, on the cards. Uh, we have done so in the past, uh, but right now the emphasis is on, on cash uh, dividends. Um, as, as a measure of, of returning, uh, returning the capital uh, back to shareholders. And then another question on, um, on the stock exchange, are you intending to list MPC uh, on a, a US uh, stock exchange? Um, there's currently uh, no concrete plans to, to change the, uh, or to, to add uh, maybe a US uh, stock exchange. Um, needless to say that this is a topic that has been explored uh, in the past and, and is being monitored uh, continuously. Uh, obviously, there needs to be a, there needs to be a real benefit from 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 an MPC stock perspective uh, by co-listing or dual listing the stock uh, in the US. Uh, meaning there needs to be a significant um, increase in, in share liquidity. Uh, but yeah, th this is something that that is being uh, evalu evaluated on a on a uh, continuous continuous basis. I don't see any further questions uh, on the web. So, Moritz, if you have no more questions, then uh, maybe we can come to closing remarks. Sure. Um, yeah, again, uh, thanks a lot, Nicolas, for, for having us. Uh, always a pleasure. Um, I can just uh, repeat myself. It's, um, it's, been a, it's been a bumpy ride in 23 uh, from a market perspective. Uh, a lot of volatility. I think the stock performance has been... Uh, uh, incredibly uh, resilient, uh, being a testament to to the company itself and and capital allocation uh, strategy, walking the talk when it comes to to returning capital to shareholders, but also being very mindful on on a low leverage uh, strategy, uh, but also uh, from from a free uh, renewal optimization perspective. So I think uh, again, we're very well positioned for 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 twenty three, uh, sorry for twenty four and twenty five, and and are well equipped for for any opportunities that, that Laya had. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for uh, this very interesting presentation and of course for the q and I'd like to thank all of our participants for joining today. And uh, as a reminder, uh, this uh, presentation, this webinar will be available for access upon demand very shortly on both the uh, CapitalLink website at uh, capitallinkwebinars.com and also on our YouTube uh, channel. Moritz, thank you, and thank you to everybody. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you. Bye-bye.